Welcome to the second half of our exploration on romance, Christian discipleship at the intersection between relationships and sexuality. With our time here, we're going to explore the challenges of actually living into God's design for sexuality in a broken world. In order to do that well, we need to take a look at why relationships and sexuality and identity are all frustrated by sin. We call it the fall. Let me visit a passage in Genesis that you're probably well familiar with, and we'll tarry over how this biblical story diagnoses the issue of sin and how it affects our relationships with each other, ourself, and with God. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. There's something problematic and familiar about the story we know as the fall. The idea that not only did the serpent make Eve and Adam believe that they weren't already like God. Remember, they're made in God's image and likeness. So there's this already this questioning of their identity and value and worth in the presence of God. But he also capitalizes on their desire to define good and evil for themselves. They want to call the shots. And up until this point in the biblical narrative, it was God saying, this is good. This is good. This is good. But humanity, we have a really bad track record of determining what is good and evil on our own. We call it moral autonomy. Some things that feel like they should be right are wrong, and some things that feel like they're wrong are right. And we have this confusion, this that we can't really trust completely our internal desire of what is good. And so, here it is. A diagnosis of sin is a brokenness and our relationship between what is right. And the problem is that it affects relationships right after this scene. Adam and Eve are at each other's throats, blaming each other. They're hiding from God, the one who made them. When the fall touches our relationship between us and God, we settle for something less than who we fully are. We dehumanize ourselves. When it touches our relationship between us and each other, especially in the context of relationships and and sexuality, We feel a sense of alienation from one another, and the experience of these fractured relationships only lead us further towards shame. This is how the fall touches our sexuality and our spirituality. All relationships are touched by this brokenness, and thus it's no surprise that our most intimate act of interrelationality, what we call sex, is frustrated, challenged, broken, twisted, and changed. By sin. Well, sex is touched by the fall. Yes, God designed it and it's amazing and it's intended for something really good, but it is not immune to the fall. Something God designed for good has been fractured by sin. Therefore, discipleship is challenging. Living out God's design for sex is often against our sinful nature. And it's this topic of sinful nature that we must understand how it shapes our desires our romance. Romans 8 gives us a a good picture of how desire and what we want and what we think is good and what we aim at is is touched by uh, this brokenness that we call sin. Let me read Paul here. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It 
does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation but it is not according to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So what is what is Paul talking about? This is pretty dense, right? Well, this idea of flesh, what does Paul mean by that? Uh, I consulted a, a wonderful resource called the Dictionary of Paul and his letters, and it kind of encapsulates what Paul means by this phrase, flesh. What he means is rebellious human nature, the part of us that doesn't want the good things of God. There is a part of us. We have to acknowledge it. We have to call it out. We have to realize it's there and it's shaping us and our desires that doesn't want what God wants. We'll call this the flesh. The scholars in this resource are are exploring Paul's use of the Greek word sarx. That's fun to say. Sarx. Sarx. Manifestations of a rebellious independence from God's promised provision in life and personal worth through faith in Jesus. What do we do with this sinful nature, this fleshly desire, this desire that's been compromised by our own twisted sense of what is good? Well, the answer is pretty simple, according to Paul. The idea that we walk with the Spirit and our desires change. And the commentators here would say, the Spirit's goal is struggling against it. So we realize that discipleship in sexuality is this struggle uh, to live according to God's desires more than our own because our desires are compromised. But can our desires be transformed? Can we crave the good things of God? Stick with me. Before we get there, let's just look at how sin warps our romance. Let's read again from Paul in Romans chapter 1. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their heart to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. So guys, it doesn't get any clearer than this. When God is not the center of our identity, he's not the center of our hopes and dreams, he's not the center of our romance, idolatry takes place. And idolatry dehumanizes us, alienates us, and causes us into shame. That our desires are actually corrupting us. So moral autonomy leads to brokenness between God and humanity. We call it idolatry. Between humanity and self, there's a degradation that Paul is speaking of here. And between human and self, the commodification of sexuality. That we just become a thing less than what God wanted us to be. We view each other and ourselves as sexual playthings rather than people made for covenant relationship, made in the image of God. Do you see how our desires, when they drive the way and are not subject to transformation by the gospel, they actually make us less than who we are. Rebellion against God corrupts sexuality. Sin dehumanizes sexuality and self. Think of the ways that we treat each other as commodities, as less than human. Think of the ways in our society that we have weaponized, commodified, 
and made sex into something that sells. There is sex trafficking. There is pornography. There is the one-night stand culture that we simply treat each other as a consumable. That's not what God intended. That's not what's going to make us feel the fulfillment of God's sexual design. Moral autonomy leads to bad taste. I think that's a simple way to put it. We desire broken things. We might call this license. In other words, do whatever you want, whatever feels good, whatever feels right, or a repulsion of whole things. And we have this other response to sexuality that we see, maybe we could call it purity culture, where it almost makes sex out to be something as bad, something totally morally bankrupt. And, and, and there's this sense that it's dirty and wrong. And either one of these things is evidence of the fall, that our, our own calling the shots of what is good and bad, we're so, we're not intuitive about it, that it leads to bad taste. And the good things God wants for us, we learn to label wrong. And the bad things that God doesn't want for us, we learn to label as good. Rebellion against God corrupts sexuality. Sin dehumanizes sexuality and self. So let me demonstrate what I'm talking about here. This commonality between license and legalism, they're both broken views of sexuality. This is a graphic from a ministry called Husband Material. Pornography portrays sex this way. It's whatever, it doesn't matter, it's casual. Purity culture, on the other hand, portrays it as forbidden, nasty, gross, dirty. Either of these things is a low view of sex. Did you catch that? And in our first exploration, all we talked about was God's high view of sexuality. If both of these things are evidence of how sin has fractured our relationship with sexuality, how can we walk in wholeness? And this is our very challenge, the reclamation of sex, the way God designed it. Discipleship in Christ leads to wholeness. We restore God as the center of our identity. We call this worship. We learn to crave whole things. We learn to see what he says is good as good, and we crave it, we desire that. It transforms everything. It transforms our relationships between each other, where we learn to honor each other as made in the image of God, as part of the family of God. The people we're looking at are not commodities at that point. They are siblings. They're part of our family, worthy of dignity. And thus, this is what we restore to ourselves, that, that God is bestowing upon us a incredible dignity, that we're made in his image. You are not a product. You are not a plaything. You are not someone else's to use. You are made in God's image. That is a dignified way of viewing your own body. So submission to God redeems sexuality. Obedience humanizes sexuality and self. What does this mean? It's a transformation of desire. Discipleship leads to good taste. We learn to crave whole things, not like the purity culture that labels something like sex as dirty or impure, but we crave covenanted sexuality the way God designed it. It's something that we, we aim for and we want to walk in purity in. And we learn to have a distaste for things that are broken. We see the cheapness of anything other than covenant sexuality. We see how cheap and, and tormentious the, the pornography industry is, or casual sex, what it does to distort and splinter our souls. We learn to realize it. That's, that's not healthy. Yeah, maybe there's a part of me, my sinful nature, that craves that kind of casuality or, or non-commitment, but in discipleship, we learn to realize, I, I don't really crave that anymore because I, I crave the good things of God. So again, submission to God redeems sexuality. Obedience humanizes sexuality and self. And so what I'm hoping you're hearing loud and clear is that desire plays a role in your discipleship. Whether you're aiming for marriage and covenant fulfillment and sexuality, or whether you're aiming for singleness and purity in that way, regardless of what your aims are, desire is not something to check at the door when you're a Christian. It's something to be transformed.
by the cross. <laughs> this is called the fruit of the Spirit. You guys have heard this, right? The, the, the abiding in God that changes our very character, that following God changes our desire. In contrast to the works of the sarks, the flesh, as Paul had put it, there is the fruit of the Spirit. For fun, let's say fruit in Greek too. Karpas. 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 Paul is describing this thing that happens within us that grows in our discipleship with God, that we learn to crave things that are whole. The enablement supplied by the Spirit excludes both legalism and license. So I'm, I'm hoping you're hearing that loud and clear, that, that uh, false sense of, of righteousness that the purity culture is aiming at by portraying sex as bad. That's not it. Uh, And neither is the licentious behavior of, it doesn't really matter, it's just sex. None of those things are fruit of the Spirit. Purity first, discipleship second, is fake news. You you see, uh, we have desires. The answer isn't to squash those desires and pretend they're not there, Uh, like an ascetic. The the, the answer is, is neither giving in to all those desires as they stand, compromised by the sinful nature by the flesh. The answer lies in partnering with God in obedience, that we, through following Christ, find our desires transformed and reinterpreted through the cross, walking with God. Discipleship must be a part of our conversation of sexuality. What hope do we have to transform our own desires outside of the abundant, transformative nature of the cross? the grace of God. You see, when we do that, when we submit our sexuality, when we submit our desires to God, we see, just as we talked about in the first half of our exploration, that sexuality, as in the garden version of sexuality, God's original design, reappears as the ideal. Questions of following Christ in discipleship and that affecting our sexuality, it was a common topic in the New Testament letters. Let's just take a a look at how these people were processing their own uh, cultural milieu and realizing that God was calling them to a better way. Paul talks about this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1 through 8. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more, for you know what instructions we gave by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should not be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable not in passionate lusts like the pagans who do not know God. And in this manner, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. We expect our discipleship to touch our relationship with sexuality. To the Corinthians, he wrote, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and stomach for the food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body by his power. God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh, but whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Do you see this high view of sex that we're the very temple of God and that what we do in our body is part of our way to honor or dishonor God? And here a direct quote from Genesis, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. The Genesis ideal stands as the way that sexuality is expressed by God's design for Christian discipleship. The garden sexuality, the wholeness of sexuality that God intended resurfaces as the ideal for Christians who want their desires transformed, that is what we're aiming for. And from these emerge an idea called sexual integrity. As our bodies are the temple of the living God, we realize that what we do in them can bring God 
honor. And we also exercise self-control, that we realize that, that if we view each other as consumables, we're actually doing damage against God's temple, against His image. And so we must see each other in this light as sexual beings designed to honor God through covenant sexuality. Therefore, we must see sex as sacred to the heart of God. We can see that it's something that's meant to honor Him, to dignify ourselves, and for us to bear witness to and participate in the very romance of God. Sexual integrity invites us to see each other the way God sees us. It's worthy of dignity and honor and requiring our self-control when it comes to our desires. Bodies matter to God. It also uh, advocates for self-control, the, the, the transformation of our desires, right? It's, it's a challenging process, but one of those fruit of the Spirit is self-control. And so the things that are un, unreformed in us, the places where the flesh still exists and pulls us towards broken things and our desires and our cravings are still broken, that we're able in discipleship to walk with God and grow in the ability to refuse those things, to turn them down to have self-control. And then there's the idea of sacredness, that what happens in sexuality as temples of God in our bodies, that we are actually playing out the dramatic and romantic drama of God within our covenant sexuality, within the covenant of marriage. We can live in sexual integrity. The New Testament authors believe in this just in the way that they believe in the resurrection that god has the power to transform our desires if god can raise jesus from the dead he can reclaim your sexual desires for his purposes can we aim for sexual integrity my brothers and sisters can can we do this this should be our goal we're not simply looking at legalism or license we're looking at a transformed desire an embrace of God's desire for sexuality. If you already feel like you've commodified yourself or you've failed to live into sexual integrity, then you share in common with all of Christian disciples the struggle of following Christ. And, and I don't want the conversation on sexuality to be prefigured and, and, and overshadowed by a sense of guilt or that the ideals of the New Testament and living out covenant sexuality and covenant obedience are so unachievable that you're doomed to fail. I don't think guilt should drive us towards purity. It's love that should drive us. It's romance with God. I hope this is landing clearly. I want to quote from an old sermon from a man named Thomas Chalmers. Only way to dispossess of an old affection, a desire, is by the expulsive power of a new one. Nothing can exceed the magnitude of the required change in a man's character when bidden as he in the New Testament. Now, it is altogether worthy of being remarked of those men who thus disrelish spiritual Christianity and, in fact, deem it an impracticable requirement. How much of a piece their incredulity about the demands of Christianity? No wonder they feel the work of the New Testament to be beyond their strength so long as they hold the words of the New Testament to be beneath their attention. Neither they nor anyone else can dispossess the heart of an old affection, but by the expulsive power of a new one. And if that new affection be the love of God, the best way of casting out an impure affection is to admit a pure one, and by the love of what is good to expel the love of what is evil. Thus it is that the freer the gospel, the more sanctifying is the gospel, and the more it is received as a doctrine of grace, the more it will be felt as a doctrine according to godliness. For the practical guidance of those who would like to reach the great moral achievement of our text, but feel that the tendencies and desires of nature are too strong for them, we know of no other way by which to keep the love of the world out of our heart than to keep in our hearts the love of God. And no other way by which to keep our hearts in the love of God than building ourselves up on our most holy faith. Let the love of God and, and the wrapping up of your own story, your own sense of identity, your body, your relationships within his romance, that is the motivating factor. Be 
because we love God. We want to honor God with our bodies, through all our failures, through all our struggles, through all our challenges. The most important thing about you isn't your sexual purity. It's your devotion to God. And when we're devoted to God, we want to be sexually pure. Our desires are transformed. Living in sexual integrity is challenging. Living this way is hard. And the motivating factor of this should not be guilt or fear or a sense of dirtiness, <laughs> that you can't be made pure again. I don't want you to hear those things in this challenge to sexual integrity. And I don't think guilt is the primary motivator of a gospel of grace. The primary motivator is the love of God. Because we love God, we want to follow him into obedience with every aspect of our, of our lives our behavior, our identity, our words, our actions, our text messages, our internet searches. All of our lives are subject to transformation in Christ because we love Christ and predominantly because he loves us. So would you let his good romance shape you first? Would you let the doctrine of God's grace transform you? So when we submit our romantic nature to the service of God and his romance, our desires are transformed. We no longer crave broken things, cheap sexual thrills of promiscuity and pornography, but rather the fullness of sexual design, the purity of marriage covenant, or the purity of singleness. Our sexuality should seek the wholeness God intended for it. God doesn't come to remove your desire. He comes to transform it. Would we walk in discipleship and watch our desires be transformed? It's hard, it's challenging, it's not easy. We're, it's, we're gonna struggle it out together. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about it. We're, we're gonna have a space for, for failure and growth and for, for questions. But at this core of any conversation about discipleship and about what we're aiming for, it's the love, responding to the love of God, watching him change our hearts as we attempt to obey him. Do you believe that? Don't you want to live towards God and submit your sexuality towards him and live in the wonderful challenge in discipleship that we would call sexual integrity. Let's be transformed in our romance, responding to God, being a part of his story and living in the purity of God's love as our desires are transformed by him. So guys, I hope this has been a helpful exploration. I hope this has been a great foundation for conversations, a great frame and container for all the details, all the particular struggles and, and places of questioning and vulnerability that make up the very sensitive topic so close to our identity and self-expression that we know as sexuality. If you are willing to submit your sexuality to Christ, I have no doubt that you will find fulfillment. I believe that about God. I believe that about following God, that God wants us to experience good things. Let's not settle for anything less, my brothers and sisters.